All right, guys, let's get started. You ready to party? Yeah! Then what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> All right, we're going to have a good panel. We have really smart people here. Um, I'm here to balance out the IQ, so it's all good. So we want to have a lively panel. Line up against the wall. You will not be shot. With a spare Maybe. Uh, exactly. A we, want, we want beer, so uh, bring it on. So my name is Dimitri Perich, uh, the evil Russian. I'm, uh, I run uh, threat research for McAfee. Uh, as every uh, conspiracy theorist knows, uh, we are writing all the malware. Uh, if you haven't seen our stock price... You should take a look. It's really working well. <laughs> and Soviet Russia malware writes you. <laughs> All right, so let's get serious for a minute. We have a pretty serious topic, cyber warfare. If you don't think it's a serious topic, uh, your politicians, your policymakers certainly do, and they're uh, enacting lots of policies and laws uh, that are going to impact all of you. So uh, it's a good topic for discussion. I'll let the panelists introduce themselves briefly, explain what they do, why you should listen to them. So let's kick it off. Um, my name is John Strand with Paul.com.com. My name is Ed Scotus. Uh, I'm uh, within Guardians. I also am an instructor with the Sands Institute. I've been involved with uh, cyber warfare planning and ideas and strategies and such for the last five years. Um, and I'm excited to be here. I'm Phyllis Schneck. I run uh, Threat Intelligence for the Americas from McAfee. I'm, I'm shocked that we read all that malware. Um, but <laughs> thank you, Dimitri, for your labs for that. Um, I also lead our critical infrastructure protection work, and I uh, used to run the FBI's InfraGuard program on the private sector side. So hello to all of you who text messaged me from InfraGuard. I appreciate it. I'm Mark Sox. I run the Internet Storm Center. I fired my first evil packet in hostility in 1998, and I was on the cover of Computer World as a cyber warrior in 2000, if you can believe that, in uniform, no less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, big deal, right? And you were strapping back then. Yeah. We'll ask Mark to show his scars from cyber warfare later on. That's right. Bullet, bullet <laughs> All right, let's kick off the discussion. So to frame it, I want to see how you define cyber warfare. Do you think it's hype? Is it real? Have we seen examples of it? Does it need to involve loss of life? What do you think cyber warfare is? Anyone? Go, John. You're first. Go ahead. Um, you know, I think a lot of this debate started with Marcus's presentation in Malaysia talking about what is, what is basically cyber warfare is bullshit. It's all his Marcus fault. Marcus Raynum. <laughs> so, not Take the other Marcus. No, not that Marcus. The other Marcus. <laughs> the other Marcus. Yeah. But Marcus is equally fetching in a uniform. Don't ask what kind of uniform, though. Um, <laughs> so, he's got pictures on You're his website. You're talking about Raynum. Yes. Be very yeah, clear. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, you know, when we're talking about this, I think it can be broken down to a lot of different semantic definitions to basically say, well, is it a nation attacking another nation directly? Is it going through proxies? Are they actually trying to bring down infrastructure? Are they trying to bring down the power grid? What is it that they're trying to do? Um, and I would say that any time you're doing any type of reconnaissance from country to country, doing things like espionage, I think it would qualify under that broad umbrella. I don't so think you, that we so should... So you would call it. espionage warfare the thing that we've been doing for thousands of years? Yeah, absolutely. If you're actually doing hostile actions without actually launching, uh, it's not political. But espionage is not hostile. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. I, 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 I think it's something we I would say do. it's a precursor, Don't you spy though. I definitely on your say it's a precursor. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Well, well it's, it's not that hard. Him. His access point's wide open. So, oh. so but other definitions, please. That come makes in. it legal, right? Yeah. Okay. It makes yeah, it legal. I, I, my, my definition involves a, a nation state. Not necessarily the nation, a nation state on both sides. It doesn't have to be state on state action. But uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Hot but, uh, state on state. but the state is either a target of perhaps a non state actor or the, uh, maybe a state is sponsoring the kind of. The, uh, the does it have to be internet based? It does not have to be internet based. No, there's, there's all kinds of technologies that uh, are network based but aren't internet based. Um, it also doesn't have to involve the loss of life. There's plenty of forms of warfare that don't involve the loss of life. It has to involve some action of manipulation, some, some level of, um, of violence to achieve a political goal, either from a nation state or to a nation state. That's how I define it as cyber warfare. And I take uh, espionage out of that definition because I think otherwise it just gets too blurry and everything becomes some form of cyber war. Because it's so clear otherwise. <laughs> That's right. So uh, animals have been fighting since they walked the planet. Um, we have always been at war in some way. We just have some new toys now. So I think uh, while we do need to define it so that we can work it, uh, more important than defining it is understanding that cyber events cause physical consequence, whether you take out part of a financial infrastructure or you get into, I'm sure this will come up later, so let's go for it, the grid. 
Um, if you cause some change to our way of life, whether you're a nation state or a bored kid in your bedroom, um, that is in some way a piece of this new electronic warfare. Wendy, you have a question? Is that a Herf gun? You don't have a beer. Are you just happy to see us? <laughs> yeah, you're working on your Jeopardy questions for tonight. Aren't you? <laughs> Come on down. Yeah. Are you in line for a question win, or are you just standing up against the wall? That's the question well, that's wall. That's like the question line. You're ignoring there. the rules. <laughs> drink, win. Drink, drink. Yeah. <laughs> oh, then bring oh. him on up. Oh, please, please, Father, come forward. Ask us a question. <laughs> bring order to this chaos. I have three daughters, and I. I we have a mic for you. Yeah, use the mic so everybody can hear. <laughs> I'd love to hear more about your daughters. I have three, I have three daughters. Uh, I can't bring order anywhere, sir, but thank you. Uh, I, had, I had two questions. Uh, one is, uh, you're the four star, sir, or, or you, commanding the new cyber command. Okay, for a moment. Now, here's the issue. Or the question: How do you, you know, you watch the movies, and it says the Air Force, the the Pentagon, has all this great apparatus for visualizing the battle space. You see, Bruce, Bruce Willis calls somebody, and that kind of thing. But but in reality, how? Do we use technology to depict cyberspace and, and depict it connected to kinetic space? W one thought someone said at, at one point was go to a planetarium and then just begin to free associate. But the question is, reaching forward, how do you present the battle space that is cyberspace in a way that, that you as commander can see what you need? I, 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 so what you're it, trying to do is visualizing cyberspace. Yes, sir. That's one question. And then the, the other you're one You're asking is, two questions and no beer? Yeah. This is... Uh, I'm sorry. And it's I a series one is of, the limit for I, freebies. I noticed the airborne wings with full respect all the way, sir. Yeah, the internet but, is a series of two. Phrase, phrase so. your, your statement as a question. <laughs> <laughs> and they're for porn. What question is help. For that four-star commander, God bless him, or her, how do you visualize... Uh, how do, you, how do we visualize cyberspace? How do we do it? Most how people do, use Windows 98 with okay. Explorer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, think, I think to answer the question, I think that any time you're going into that, if you're a four-star, you've got to be very goal-oriented. What is it that you want to do? Otherwise, you can get completely buried under all the minutia of all the third-party applications. You've got to say, tactically, this is what I want to achieve, and then focus on the points that will help you achieve that particular well, goal. What's missed a lot of times, too, is the logistics world. Yeah. You know, it's not just about operations. It's not just about getting getting in the way of, of weapons systems and things, but there is a lot of things you can do to screw up a, a, an, an opponent's logistics side that is just as fair in this type of warfare, and sometimes far more effective. And, and uh, because the logistics world is connected to the Internet, whereas most command and control systems aren't, that's a direct path for a lot of opportunity seekers, per se, even those who want to get into a war that are not necessarily combatants. All right, let's get out of theory and talk about examples. Do you, do you have an example? Well, all right, go ahead. The example is the airplane I flew in today. I'm really glad my pilot knew there wasn't a 747 next to me, or if he did know it, he found it, and he found it on radar. So what they've done in the air community is they've taken all the planes in the sky, and they've triangulated that in many different points, and they show a pretty little airplane in a horizon line to the guy flying the plane that doesn't have to do much to figure out how to stay away from it, and that's what we as an industry have to figure out how to do with cyberspace. One of the, one of the things that I really liked about the question is it, it talked about the fact that you've got the cyberspace and you've got, call it the kinetic space, meat space, whatever you want to call it. And visualization that can bring both of those together. One of the things that frustrates me is when we start talking about the cyberspace, some people get a little bit of uh, you know, hippy-drippy on this kind of stuff, saying, oh, it's a, it's a completely man-made environment where you can just recreate the rules. Remember Morpheus talking to Neo? Right. It's like, For those of you keeping your reference, that's Ed's go to Matrix reference number one. It didn't even take you five minutes. I, to get to I, I had to do it. I, that's a record. Anyway, folks. Give this, it up for Ed. A five round of minutes. applause for Ed's go to everybody. The, the, the fact of the matter is, is as, as much as we you know love Morpheus, no, there are some <laughs> rules in this space. <laughs> And, and, and really, if we can overlay the physical space and the cyberspace, it, it, it allows us to kind of get the holy grail here of joint operations. I was doing a presentation at the Pentagon, not classified or anything like that, and um, I was going through an attack scenario. There's a computer here and here and here, and uh, there was a guy sitting in the front row, and he, he raised his hand as I'm going through this hacks this and that hacks that. And I said, yes, your question, sir. He raises his hand. He says, what about that one machine over there? What do you do with that one? And I looked up at it and said, oh, that one, that nah, doesn't matter. You just blow that one up. 
So I continue to present, and a couple seconds later, he raised his hand again. You know, full uniform or anything. Yeah, yes, what's your question now? Sir, when you said you blow that computer up, did you mean kinetically? And I thought, that's just, no, I meant, you know, like blue screen or something like that. But to have that in your bag of tricks gives you some additional capabilities <laughs> in, uh, and, and likewise, likewise, for... How big of a bag? <laughs> yeah, really big bag of tricks. <laughs> well, they get through TSA. He was a Marine, so, I but, but the... <laughs> The ability to do joint operations between cyber and kinetic warfare is a very powerful thing. And, uh, and I think we need to think along those lines, and our visualization should also encourage that thinking. All right, so have we seen cyber warfare? Let's, we talk why don't about we take another question? Because we've got a few Oh, we, we have them lining up. Do, yeah. they, do these ones have beer? No. They're still, they're still dry. He's pressure. halfway drink. That's good enough. I'm cheap. Bring it up. Yeah, yeah let, let, let the audience. No. Sorry to be a pain in the ass. You got an empty seat? Please raise your hand because there's a bunch of people standing in the back. If you're on that wall, you better have a fucking question. And fucking beer. Yeah. <laughs> and fucking beer. <laughs> there you go. All right, we got a dry question. Come on. It's going to be dry. I actually did see my wife go. Sound beer. off in that microphone. So right yes, I'm sir. Not okay. So we'll start I with have... your name and what street you grew up on, please. Yeah, uh, and your mother's maiden name. Social security <laughs> would help, too. Oh, we can get that um, later. My name's Johnny Long. <laughs> <laughs> I hack stuff. <laughs> I hack stuff. <laughs> okay, so I'll give you two questions. You can answer which one ever sounds funnest. Did somebody email those questions to you, sir? No, I have to take notes. I'm really, really stupid. Up okay. here? Fair enough. So are we. Okay, the first is, what part does active um, response play in cyber defense? And the second one would be, we've seen a lot at this conference about um, cyber warfare on uh, network-based services to users and such, how will that evolve into attacks on SCADA-based networks? So answer what you like. Well, we can start off active defense. Uh, you know, there's a whole continuum of defensive things we can do. You can change passwords. You can put in firewall rules. I mean, very low level. There's an upper part that, that crosses beyond and gets out of what a normal defender does. Uh, you can shut down uh, TCP sessions, you know, do a reset attack, you can uh, deflect attacks, you can do keystroke monitoring and go back and hack back, and you know, after a while you kind of cross this line. A lot of times it becomes legal in terms of what, what can I and can't I do. This is where if you are in this space you have a good lawyer in your back pocket that's keeping you honest. Unfortunately, we have a lot of cowboys now that are coming into this world that don't understand that and they don't know where the lines are and they put their country at risk because they do want to actively go out and try and find out what's happening. That's, that is a, a problem we're going through at the moment as we're beginning to learn what this means about cyber conflict and cyber war. And we're going to have to work on that. And, and one of the things I oh go ahead okay one of the things I really 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 want everyone in the room to start thinking about is anytime we bring up active defense, there's a bunch of people that get this knee jerk reaction that says, oh we can't do that. I want everybody to start thinking about it at the very least because there's going to be a point where we do need that type of capability and at least it'd be cool if that capability existed. Um, one of the th examples I'd like to say is who was in Val Smith's talk today uh, about Metafish? Raise your hand. It was a really really cool talk. We were talking about malicious PDFs, right? Why don't you seed those throughout your environment? If somebody gets access to those PDFs that they should not have access to and they open them on their system, we now have a backdoor into their computer. Now, of course, you want to consult with a lawyer because there's smart ways to do this and there's ways that are very, very dumb. But at least start thinking about that capability because it might be something that you need to ramp up on very quickly. Interesting. All right. So examples. Back to the question I asked half an hour ago. <laughs> Have we seen cyber warfare? If yes, what are the John examples? Had a SCADA question. Yeah, had a second we got SCADA. Part. We'll ignore that yeah, one. I want, I want to talk about that for a minute. So Bruce Willis did a really big favor for us as a country. He, he oh, taught our policymakers a few things, right? That's what Bruce Willis did. That movie was educational for a lot of the Hill, right? Um, what hurt us is that there are people, uh, not in this industry, but there are people running around thinking that that's how it happens. So we use the word SCADA, we really should be saying industrial control systems and looking at it. It's actually not that easy to, well, maybe in this room it is, but it's actually in general not that easy to, quote, attack one of these. It's everything we built around it. It's the Internet uh, systems that we built around it. It's the IP-enabled back-channel connections that we put around them. And a lot of the ways to get in there are not even Internet. So looking at that is, is clearly something that is going to be part of cyber warfare because, again, you have that cyber event causing a physical consequence. What Bruce Willis did, though, is he did stir... Uh, he did start the hill to start thinking, but we do need to make sure, as people in this industry, teaching the rest of the world that 
probably isn't true that there are nine or ten Chinese citizens in a hamster wheel inside the smart grid. So just need to yeah. start looking at how to differentiate the terminology and teach people a few things. And, and to Phyllis's you know, first point, when she said, uh, you know, humans have waged war for thousands of years, and it just moves into these new domains as we do. Um, you know, when we started to be seafaring, of course, we started waging war on the water. When we started having airplanes, we waged war there. Uh, space, yeah, it's very expensive to wage war up there, but there are certain pieces. It's going to spread to cyberspace, and cyberspace, it will consist of components including the SCADA systems, the smart grid. War will go there. Um, and when I first started doing this kind of work, it, it really kind of saddened me, and I was frustrated, and I had all these sort of ethical, moral qualms and such. Did you have hair um, back then? No, actually, I lost it before that. <laughs> but thanks. <laughs> People in glass houses, right? So um, anyway, uh, <laughs> the... Um, but, you know, I started thinking about this, and first of all, it's inevitable. You could try to fight the militarization of cyberspace and that, but, um, but, but people do engage in war. That's what we do, and as we engage in new arenas, we will engage in war in those new arenas. And I don't think you should delude yourself. So I, I started to think about it in these new ways. And uh, remember that, uh, that old Dr. Strangelove movie, right? Um, and I realized, you know, it's how I uh, learned to stop worrying and love the, hack. love the hack. So, yeah. You know, you keep asking about real-world examples, and to just tie into what we're talking about, uh, how many of you have heard of the Farewell Dossier? Show of hands. A few. Oh, we need some educating. I think if you give them a year, yeah, some write, of them might have heard it. Write that down in your little book of things to do, Farewell Dossier. That's going to be a question on Hacker Jeopardy tonight. Yeah, well, yeah when? You got Are that? you taking notes? There we go. Um, there is a wiki page on it, and there is a CIA page on it. It's a very interesting real-world event that happened back in the early 80s, uh, some would call it a supply chain attack. We did some manipulation of equipment that the Russians were or the Soviets were trying to obtain from the West and obtain in a strange manner. So we gave them the equipment they were looking for, but it had a value-added feature. And once this the, is one outstanding there we goon. Go. This man. is a good man. This is awesome. a good goon. This awesome. is a good goon, folks. Thank you, my goon friend. So Thank once the much. equipment was installed, the value-added feature allowed the country of the United States to execute the detonation of a very large um, natural gas facility in the Soviet Union. This was in 1982. And it really set a kind of precedence there, mainly because it shows our nation has the willpower to do this. So we you define do, this as a cyber warfare act? Uh, it, in its infancy. You've got to put in context where we were in 1982 in terms of networks. Very different from today. But if this was 1982, that would clearly be an act of cyber okay. warfare. Let's talk about the hype for a second. Estonia, all that other shit that's been going on. Oh, don't Georgia. forget North Korea. The North, yeah, Korea. Exactly. The North Korean deal. So I love, I love the North Korean example and the unnamed U.S. officials that said they traced it to North Korean IPs when North Korea doesn't even have an internet connection. <laughs> They're operating out of China. Yeah. <laughs> Were the gerbils again? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> So there was an interesting um, article in the New York Times, so it must be true, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago about the Russian-U.S. Uh, uh, bilateral uh, negotiations where the Russians are bringing up the issue of uh, a treaty that would like to have on cyber, war uh, cyber warfare disarmament. And the U.S. Uh, State Department obviously is not too hot on the idea. What's your take on it? Can we have a treaty on disarmament in cyber? Can you verify it? We do such a great job of that in WMD space. Uh, can we be successful in cyber? Yeah, go ahead. And then I'll sure. Um, well, you know, I think if you if you have a, a treaty like that and China's not involved, it's it's not terribly useful, kind of meaningless, and um, so I'm, I'm concerned about the, you know, s having uh, signing something like that. Um, also, I do think that because of the asymmetry and the very low cost barrier of entry. Um, even if you had such a treaty, organizations and governments could develop these capabilities without, uh, without the other side knowing. Inspection is almost impossible. When no. you make nuclear weapons, you have residue. When you make chemical weapons, you need uh, industrial infrastructure that can be tracked uh, to some level. But when you make cyber weapons, as long as you're careful, the other side can't really find that. But, via but, but it's a treaty, Cyber Ed, weapons. A treaty. Oh, and we're always yeah. so good at following treaties. Yeah, and besides, cyber weapons are made by our enemies. You know, in, in nuclear warfare, we made our own nukes, and the Russians made their nukes, sure. and the Chinese made their nukes. Yeah. But in cyber conflict, we use software written by the Chinese, hardware made by the Russians. And vice you know, versa. And vice versa. Dan Kaminsky. Yeah. So who owns? Pardon me? Dan Kaminsky. And Dan Kaminsky, yeah. And, Dan Kaminsky, yeah. yeah. and, and uh, McAfee makes sure that there's a value-added feature. Absolutely. You know, so we, 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 do we have more questions? <laughs> 
you have a question, sir? Uh, hold on a second. We were just asked. By I see his hand doing this. <laughs> is, this a, is this a dry question or a wet question? We were just asked. Uh, a dry or a wet question? Since we had a lot of people, we were asked to uh, do the introductions again, real quick. Uh, so people know who are introductions again. Oh, you want to go that way. We're, that way. Very, right. we're, we're Mark, very, very, very Mark Sox, right. Internet Storm Center, retired military, and used to do this stuff for a living. Uh, Phyllis Schneck, VP of Threat Intelligence, the Americas for McAfee. I hope I still do this stuff for a living. Ed Scott is from In Guardians. I've been working on cyber war strategy and tactics for the last five years. Um, John Strand with Paul.com.com. Thank you. <laughs> And hey, Paul, you guys all know better. Yeah, thanks, Paul. You guys all know better. There should be more beer up here. So, thank you. All right. Dimitri Parrish McAfee, what's your question? All right. Quickly to try and save time, make my question short. Audience and speakers, who has read Damon? The book Damon. He's going to be on the show. Oops. Okay, we've got one there. Um, when did you get that question? <laughs> We're right. good. So, <laughs> you scared Win away, I think. Yeah, I think he, <laughs> he just took off. Okay, so for Paul.com.com, that's sort of my oh, there you definition go. of cyber yeah, warfare, yeah. in my mind, really happened to be that. Accepting that, I think there are a lot of us, when we hear about cyber warfare in the media, when we read an article in the New York Times, we really, really roll our eyes. And when you talk about attacking information infrastructure, um, a lot of it's still a physical act. Blowing a satellite out of the sky, renting a backhoe, and taking out a fiber connection, things like that. That, to me, is cyber warfare. That is physically denying something. But when somebody sends a bunch of denial of service attacks, that's easier to pull the plug on. And it makes me feel incredulous a lot of the time when I hear about cyber warfare. You know, what is something that's practical and something to be worried about? Because when you you know, go to some sort of war and North Korea is causing a problem and they're routed through China, it doesn't matter so much. We can lose China for a couple of days while we sort it out and the world won't end. It's you called know. appropriations. <laughs> and it's called $17 billion of new money that's been thrown out there so that we can protect ourselves against the evil DDoSing North Koreans. Right. When was that exploit originally? And we're born from China. 2004? You know, you, you make yeah. a good point, but, you know, in some of the discussions that they're having on this, the, the analogy that is being used is, is that of a blockade. A blockade is an act of war, right? You know, blocking access to a port so that ships can't get in and get out. There's economic effects of that and so forth. So if you accept that a blockade is an act of war, which it has been for a good long time, what is the Internet equivalent of that, or taking it off the Internet, the cyber equivalent of that against the smart grid and so forth? Um, I think you could very easily make direct analogies to that. That's a fair, that's a fair I, question. Fair analogy. One of the things, you know, I, I want to get away from the semantics of this because I really think it's irrelevant whether or not it exists. Because does anybody in the room believe that governments are not partaking in, like, cyber, espionage, warfare, whatever you want to define it, activities? Cool. All right. So let's move past that. And let's try to figure out, there if we're living in a world where, where organizations, large-scale, large non-state actors and nation-states, are funding hundreds, if not thousands of people to develop offensive capabilities, how does that impact you? And I think that that's probably the more pertinent question. We can debate whether or not it exists and how we want to define it all day, but I desperately think we need to start figuring out how we deal with this in the world today, because it does change the way that we have to model our threats coming after our environment. Well, the scary part, too, is in the 21st century cyberspace and we all hate to use that term and we wish there was something better, but that's what we've got, is the economic engine. It's like the industrial age. It's the steam of the industrial age, except now it's in the 21st century. And we're going to fight over it, and we're going to contest it, and we're going to deny it from each other. And mm -hmm. so it's going to affect the economy just at a time when we really need the economy to be taking off. Do we want to contest cyberspace, or do we want to make it into an economic engine? Which is more important for the future of the country? But if we're going to move down that path, I don't believe that that's something that we can defend as a nation. I think that the defense of it actually has to be in the hands of all the people that have their own systems. In short, they've got to start defending their crap. So a second now. amendment in cyberspace would be a good thing. That would be Yeah! Right to bear digital arms. Yes. <laughs> all right, next question, please. I wonder please. what concealed carry looks like in cyberspace. <laughs> <laughs> mentioned economics. I'd like our panel to just go down. You mentioned McAfee is uh, getting some money out of this. All right. Uh, we had a mind reader. He mentioned economics. If you guys could just go down one by one, and, uh, and, if, and you can't pick a previous choice, name who you think is making money off cyber warfare. <laughs> oh, I'll, this is easy. I'll, go ahead. You yeah, start. that's very straight. Go I'll ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll let Mark start. Yeah. Okay, I, I live in Washington, live and work in Washington. There's a large number of defense industrial base 
contractors. The, the, I like to lovingly call them the boat builders, but they build a lot more than boats. These are the, the well-known defense contractors that build the aircraft carriers, the aircraft tanks, etc. Every one of them smells money when we talk, start talking about cybersecurity. Every one of them have stood up some type of cybersecurity branch, detail, expertise, whatever. Yep. None of them run networks. <laughs> Where's the expertise? How are you experts in cyberspace if you don't run networks? I read a book, a CISSP oh, book. And they slept at a Holiday Inn Express last <laughs> yeah, night. Yeah, really. really. <laughs> so on the other side, the people making money off of this are the crooks, right? Half of Romania, a good part of uh, Russia, your ancestry, Dimitri. Um, some other ancestry, my family. It's <laughs> 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 trying to be nice. Sure. So there, there are two sides of this. There are the bomb makers and the weapons makers and the Kevlar. And, and a lot of the industry um, as a whole are working closely. We're even managing to collaborate. I won't go so far as to say information sharing will ever work. But we're even going so far as to try to collaborate, to try to put different parts of the puzzle that we all see together to create that situational awareness that I believe uh, the gentleman in, in yellow asked about visualization a little while ago. Uh, but to the point on information sharing, one of, one of my own pet peeves up in Washington is the bad guys do this right. They learn it in the prisons, they take it on the street, they keep their relationships, and they have information that they need 24-7. We have the biggest problem because of all the regulatory and the legal and all the issues we have around us with corporate competitiveness. So before we start thinking about who's making the money on it, how do we start looking at how we pool that expertise that was mentioned together as a community to fight that? Because the bad guys are already doing it, and they're way ahead. Um, consultants, contractors, vendors, certainly from a defense perspective, uh, cyber defense, there's a lot of uh, money that is uh, going to be made as uh, the, nations, the nations of the world change their defenses. Um, and also from an offense perspective, there are going to be vendors, there currently are vendors that are starting to make offensive cyber weaponry. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of money involved in this. Uh, so who makes money off of cyber warfare? I do. And so do you. <laughs> and uh, let's, let's put, figure out what that actually means. Um, how many of you guys are really frustrated whenever a big virus or a worm hits and it's on the front page of the New York Times? Your boss comes down to your office, you know, from on high, comes down into your cube, a little bit frightened to be down there. And he basically says, have you heard about this? <laughs> yeah, I get, I get all of my internet security news from the front page of the New York Times. Um, I get mine from the Internet Storm Center. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shameless yeah. plug. Yeah. Or USA Today is one of my favorites. Um, so, you know, I hate to say that we should be using fear, uncertainty, and doubt as a tool, but we should. Um, for every one of you in this room, if that's what it takes for people to finally understand and visualize the threat, then use it. Because right now they have this visualized threat that the attacker is outside in his grandmother's basement trying to break in, and they think that that's a relatively marginal threat, even though it's wrong. But if you say, the Russians are after our computers, or the Chinese, or the Israelis, insert any country here, maybe they'll finally start listening to some of the crazy things you want to do, like proper logging and hardening systems and that type of stuff. So. Who's making money? The energy companies. What do you think powers all the servers? <laughs> All right, next question. You guys uh, touched uh, briefly earlier on um, in nation state warfare, state on state action. Action, state like on it. state action. Hot, uh, hot state, state, state on state action. Hot, hot state on state, yeah. Um, is, uh, as somebody who has to uh, work to help kind of protect a large and fairly talented and not very sometimes clueless it's strange, uh, population. How do I minimize collateral damage uh, in an instance where um, we have, a, for example, say a, an American company gets sold to a Chinese company that makes laptops, for example? Who would that and, be? And, and, they send not, and, they, and then they like sell Trojan hardware to us. How do I minimize collateral damage in an instance But that's like a that? value-added feature. Uh, well, that's a value-added uh, feature. Uh, that's right remote terms. management. Okay, or better yet, how do I get hold of the API so I can use that? Are you good with Oli DBG? Yeah. Where, where do you think that company was making the hardware before they sold? <laughs> now, a very fair question. Even like uh, just the, the good old supply chain, most of our chips and things are not made here. Uh, we, except for very specialized ones in weapon systems, but consumer grade products all made overseas. How do we know that they're for real? How do we know they're not already backdoored? Uh, everybody's aware of the problems we've seen in consumer devices. The digital photo frames and iPods and countless things have come preloaded with malware. USB sticks come preloaded with malware. 
that's a very interesting angle for cyber warfare. Rather than doing a, an attack directly over in a network, do the attack through supply systems. And it works great because the social engineering factor kind of amplifies the attack. So this is not just a single method. It's not just Internet. Um, you did mention collateral damage. One of the things that is often talked about is what is the weapon system in cyber warfare? Is it physically the keyboard? Is it physically the wire? Is it virtually the packets? Is it the Cisco routers? Is it the fiber optics? I mean, what, what exactly is the weapon system and what's, who are the combatants? Uh, we tend to, as civilized countries, we tend to understand what the weapons are, the combatants, the non-combatants, the hospitals. How do we define that in cyberspace? Is a Cisco router a weapon system? If it is, can I take it out? Can I shoot cyber bullets at it? But what if it's moving hospital traffic at the same time? Does that make it a Red Cross platform? These are, these are the types of things we've, we don't have answers yet. But I think it's a very interesting discourse. Kind of goes what, what Ed's talking about. We're using some previous analogies. How do we answer these questions based on our history of how we've done warfare in a classic sense? Yeah, and, and, and you need to start thinking about these different analogies and, and how they apply. Um, you know, and, and blog about this stuff. I mean, we're right now at a time when we can have a discussion. I mean, they're defining what cyber warfare and weaponry is going to be. So, you know, use your voice here. That's uh, You know, that's a very good point because in nuclear warfare, while the nukes themselves, the yield and how much we have is highly classified, talking about it and talking about what we do and what we can do and restrictions is completely out in the open. Yeah. Why don't we do that in cyberspace? I love your idea about blogging. Yeah. We really, we really need to make it a public discussion. Declassify cyber warfare? No, no. Open the, open the conversation. The, the techniques and the tools and things like in bio, chem, whatever, we can keep that locked up. The actual talking about its use, the deployment, limitations, other things, the policies. Open that wide open. Yep, and let's start yep. talking about it. Yep. As a community, let's start talking about it. I mean, DEF CON's a perfect community. Start commenting yes, it is. on this yes, stuff. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and one of the things. What a great <laughs> idea, sir. Next year. Come, Next year. Sti- come stimulate us. <laughs> um, one of the things I also like whenever people have these types of conversations and basically saying, well, how do I defend against this type of thing? Is, you know, defense in depth is dead insofar as that we've been doing it wrong. Um, Whenever we're talking about defending our networks, we seem to think that a collection of security technologies from vendor A, B, C, D, and E is somehow the same thing as defense in depth, and I honestly don't believe that that's true. Um, So what we need to do is start thinking, okay, so what happens if my workstations become hostile, or one of the workstations? What happens if my router becomes hostile? Take your network diagram, spin it, close your eyes while you're drunk, and put your finger down and stop it and say, if this is compromised, what does that do to my entire environment? And if it basically compromises your entire environment, you do not have defense in depth. It's time to go back to the drawing board and figure out ways that you can have a more layered defense in that. What do we do about the... Sorry, Mark. But there is no perimeter. How can you have defense in depth with no perimeter? Even better. Even better. And I think that those are some of the hard questions that people have to start asking themselves. Why in the hell is it that most of our organizations, we allow our users to go onto the Internet completely unrestricted? And they say, oh, we'll use WebSense. Ew, why, why the hell is that? it that we allow our users to go to the internet completely unrestricted? So, in short, we basically imposed this lack of a perimeter on ourselves because they want it on their BlackBerry, they want to get access to eBay, they want to go to Newsweek where there's ads that are being put up with malware in them. So we've got to start defining those types of boundaries. So well, we started talking about offensive stuff uh, a little while ago. What do we do about the issue of asymmetry? The fact that the, we in the U.S. and our allies are so reliant on cyber, whereas most of our enemies are not. As Rumsfeld famously said uh, during the Afghanistan conflict, we're not running out of targets. Afghanistan is. Our enemies are running out of targets. How do we uh, create offensive opportunities for us if we don't have uh, ways to hurt them in the cyber arena? I, I think that that argument is actually, you know, given that we have a lot more targets than they do, is an argument for us to participate. Uh, what was that? It's the other way around. It's the opposite. Well, well, they have a lot more that they can attack on our infrastructure. Yeah, we have a large exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that's an argument for us to learn more about cyber warfare, prepare more for it, and uh, of course to engage in the defensive uh, strategy and planning, but also to understand what the offenses are because they could be turned against us. But in terms of our offensive options, should we include kinetic response as yes. part of the options? I, I, like I said earlier, I'm uh, very much for joint types of responses. So I, need, I think that needs to be on the table. I think it's inevitably on the table, especially if there happens to be loss of life. So in, in that spirit, going back to something you said a minute ago, where is the perimeter? So does it have to be at, at my gateway? And if our network was smarter or re-engineered or, or 
Should something I send necessarily arrive where I want it to? And why is it that we're not looking at how to make the network fabric a lot smarter and not route some of this garbage? <laughs> but whatever the yeah, there was a, a government organ- we need to start looking at as well. There was a government organization that I was working with, and uh, they were trying to identify what the hell their perimeter was. And they went through and they mapped their entire network, and they said, well, we've got like 45 different egress and ingress points in our environment. They said, well, how many of those are documented egress or ingress points? They're like five. Yeah. So what are these other ones doing? We have no clue. But you know, you keep asking for real-world examples. 1998 was a fun, interesting year, because the year before, when we had eligible receiver and things like that, it was, we showed what was theoretical. And then February of 1998, while we're dropping bombs on Baghdad, because Saddam Hussein was kind of getting out of his northern fly zone, southern fly zone, the United States Air Force comes under attack, and the, and the thinking in cyberspace. And the thinking was, this is coming out of the Middle East, all the attributions pointing back towards Iraq. It must be... Saddam Hussein that's attacking the Air Force. In the end, for those who know the story, it was two teenagers in California. They were masquerading as the Iraqis desert, attacking desert, the Air Force. Easy. Yeah. And so this type of asymmetric thinking... But Saddam was paying them, right? Oh, Saddam was paying. Well, actually, there was a loose connection back to Israel, and then it quickly gets classified after that. But it, <laughs> but it does point out the fact that we, big, mighty Western civilization with our billion-dollar systems and, and the capability to you know, carpet bomb the planet, we're up against these little countries that can come in and tickle us with a DDoS and watch Washington just go into a panic. It, in the end, this North Korean thing will turn out to be some teenager down in South America. And, and we've gone through this big spin, just like we did back in 98, thinking it was Saddam Hussein. We've got this boogeyman painted on our, on our forehead where we think that every little nation out there is going to poke a stick at us in cyberspace. In some cases, we need to get real about this. This problem, a lot of it is fantasy, but we, we need to get real. Do you think Estonia was hype? Hype? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. There was a lot of good media out of Estonia. Sure, but it, was, it, but it was educational. While there was a lot of hype associated Certainly with it, we learned lessons and, and are better prepared to, uh, yeah. to engage. Yeah. All right, we next question, then. please. Throughout, throughout the conversation so far, uh, there's been some talk about uh, physical reactions to cyber uh, terrorism or have, what have you. And kiss it like your cousin. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you had mentioned that it's hard to uh, actually attack the infrastructure uh, in, in, let's say, the industrial automation uh, world. But uh, I, don't, I worked in that doing some programming in there for a couple of years. And the current trend is to move it towards the what they call the OPC unified architecture, which is based on web services. Yeah. And, oh, no. uh, Good plan. Yeah. <laughs> that means I can Twitter my nuke, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, and I've already done some... Uh, you know, Reach little, out and touch me. I've always done. I've already done like a little bit of like proof of concept stuff with some of the new um, OPC servers and clients that are out there, and possibly you know with with some of the physical devices, uh, medical yeah, equipment. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, what, what are we doing to prepare these uh, industrial companies to handle this? Because it's going to be really easy to attack these We're devices. Them we ask them. Very, <laughs> we ask them very nicely with a letter. A lot of people are freaking out. So so. In, in my day job, we do a lot of educating ourselves on what actually is the problem because all the way around, all around us are people coming out of the woodwork saying, I have the fix for SCADA, and they're running to the hill with it, and they're running to uh, electric companies with it. Electric companies, you sit down, we just talk to them and ask them, what, what does it look like for you? How can you be helped? Teach us about this. And what we get back is, we need to learn about the NERC SIPs. You have organizations like NERC and FERC doing good work. NIST building standards, but no one is getting together, coordinating this, and communicating it back to the industry. The threat hasn't actually been defined. I would argue there are eight people on the planet that actually understand the insides of industrial control. There are probably nine that can define uh, availability and reliability, and yet they're going to start finding people a million, organizations a million bucks a day simply for not coming under compliance regulations they don't know. And then, to your point, they move the whole thing onto services that my three-year-old niece can probably get to. Yeah, get into the mic a little closer. Sorry. So, no, it's not my cousin. I don't kiss my cousins in Georgia that long. Um, So... (laughs) Social engineering at work, folks. Social engineering at work. So the answer is we as an industry, and this is probably a great forum to do that, need to 
find the people that understand the insides of these industrial control systems and learn about them. There, there are people doing this, but understand how you protect it now, how you protect it through the evolution of going from the green screen and the windows. Some of these are running on the boxes on which you played solitaire 11 years ago, and they're uh, moving forward, building the new ones, but it's a process. And in that process, there probably is a hamster wheel with some other nation state actors in it trying to get it. But we as an industry have to come together and figure out what the roadmap is to All right. build the we, standards. We, we, we have a lot of questions. Let, let, let's move quickly. So one question, one answer real quick. Be concise. What do you guys actually qualify as, you guys were talking about earlier, cyber scar? I can show you my cyber scars after this. What do you guys actually qualify as cyber damage? Is that leaking of knowledge? Is that the leak of a product ahead of schedule? Is that the destruction of applications and software databases? What do you guys qualify as? I'll tell you Come on, Marcus, I'll show us. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Show us the good. You want to see my scar? I do. <laughs> All right. Many of you have seen me around. I've got two kids, uh, two daughters. They're not kids anymore. They're 21 and 23. But many years ago when I got burned, they lost their homework. And I know this really kind of brought tears to their eyes because they were able to go back to their teacher the next day and say, Daddy's malware ate their homework. <laughs> and it's only because I was being a fool at the house and running an unprotected network and playing with crap I was downloading off of Russian websites. And it kind of got, Thank you. Kinda got <laughs> loose and burnt me. Always glad to help. Next question. So, in meat space, one of the things that distinguishes state actors from non-state actors is the rule of law and the application of rules of engagement. Um, so, does the panel believe that such concepts translate to cyberspace? Um, or is cyber war so intertwined with the intelligence process that it's going to be almost impossible to disentangle them enough to come up with coherent rules of engagement? I think I think it's almost uh, relevant due to the fact that there's very little attribution. I mean, you're not going to get a packet that says from Russia with love and say it came from them. So I think that it's very difficult to actually say this one came from Al-Qaeda, this one came from China. But you, you have the same problem in meat space. Sorry. You have the same problem in meat space with bombs, right? You have a terrorist attack. They don't, off, they don't always sign it with love from... Osama. No, I've you, seen them with Sharpies. They do. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they do, yeah. You still you have the same problem, well, man. There's the evil bit in the IP packet header, and as just long as the evil that. bit is set, we're good to go. It's an RFC standard. We just play by the rules, and we're squared away, right? I've got, that's my only IDS we're rule. We're there. All right, next, next question. question. What are you grinning about, sir? <laughs> this one's going to be good. Uh live. Uh, Bob Lentz, Friday morning, uh, said that he went aboard one of our new nuclear carriers, talked to the captain, asked the captain what the most valuable thing on the ship was. Answer was the Internet. The average age is 19.3 years. Or, uh, yep. Yeah. You made a statement, sir, that why are large companies like mine giving the employees access to the Internet? I would challenge you that we have to do that because, poll the audience, how many employees do you think we would get if we did not give the generation today access to the internet like they grew up with. That's cool. They're not working anyway. <laughs> uh, you resemble that remark, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. There we go. All oh, right. Now that was we're a talking. Wet question. <laughs> okay. So, how do you see training and not like the watching a PowerPoint slide for half an hour, but like the. Half an hour, actually, try six or eight. I was being generous. Um, <laughs> like the actually injecting IDS traffic and seeing how quickly your employees come back and you know say, hey, we had an incident. That kind of training and drilling, how do you see that playing into uh, preparing for cyber warfare? I think it's an absolutely vital thing. I mean, absolutely. people need to have real... Uh, real-world style experience, and to the extent that you can um, simulate things in your environment or set up a, uh, a test lab and show them what actual attacks will look like and for things that they should look through, have them walk through their processes to make sure they understand them, anything you can do to make it more concrete. Now, from a military perspective, I think we need to have training that encourages mission-based thinking. Here is the goal for the mission. Here is how you need to achieve the goal. And then, of course, you can't always just follow definite and plans. And by the way, 
props to DARPA because yeah. they've created the National Cyber Range. Yes. Which yep, is a absolutely. big virtual yep. test range, which is a damn good thing. Yes, and it's, it's quite vast. So it is. It's, it's very great, vast. Yeah. So, um, so we need to encourage the, the use of these kinds of things so people can really understand what they're going to face and have the flexibility when they face things that are unexpected in the cyber realm. All right. So <laughs> Thank you, <That's> Sloan <laughs> Clapper. You rock! <laughs> Ed, you got a, you got a fan right there. <laughs> <laughs> he read your book. The, yes. There's the one. Thanks, mom. So, <laughs> so if the Great Firewall of China is all just Cisco gear, and if like Iran's deep packet monitoring systems are all clearly not written by Iranians, are we going to change our export laws so that we're basically giving them the bombs against us? Well, that's the point we made earlier. In cyber warfare, they use our equipment; we use theirs. So what's your point, sir? <laughs> so, current, like, are you, our laws going to adapt to just... Well, we have laws that? against export to Iran. That's not working very well, is it? Yeah. yeah. We have laws against smoking Cuban cigars, and that doesn't stop us. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, next question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hi. Thanks for taking my question. No, um, Speak into mic, please. Okay. The, uh, the question was, I want to follow up with uh, the other guy who kind of disagreed with the idea of warfare. Um, if I can see totally the idea of defense and being able to properly defend yourself, but if it's asymmetric and it's a guy, it's a 16-year-old kid in South America who's, you know, working out of China boxes. Or South America, by the way, is the answer to everything in case um, you yeah, have your jeopardy. And, 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 then, and then one of your responses was um, possibly um, overhyping the threat and using fear and certainty and doubt to motivate people. I kind of question that myself, especially after the whole WMD to get us into the previous wars. Why don't we take the why don't why not take the idea of warfare out and make it defense? Because I mean, this is DEFCON; it's not WarCon. Um, and is why, Jeff fine? Moss here? Shall we read? That's, you know what's sad is like tomorrow there will be a new con called that because yeah, God knows con. we have enough yeah. cons. Yeah. Yeah. You know, no, but your point is de- his defensive is where he's coming from yeah. rather than being offensive. Yeah, and, and look, defense is a wonderful thing, but I think if you unilaterally decided that I'm just going to play the defense game, you're going to miss out on a lot of uh, possibilities. You're not going to understand the offensive game that the adversaries are going to play against you. Right. Um, and you're going to limit your own options so that you're going to have to respond kinetically. Who has ever won a general, war by playing defense? You don't want to do right. that. General George Patton told yourself. us defenders do not win wars. Exactly. Right. Well, I, if I may... Uh, uh, in the Civil War, uh, General Sherman said that war is hell. Yeah. Um, and DDoS attacks and you know flooding a server and turning off certain things are not uh, don't really. I don't think anyone has ever died from a DDoS attack. Uh, look at um, Enron. Whenever they that, started that, shutting down power in California and lights, traffic lights went out. There were car wrecks. People did die because of that. So. I think there are okay. examples. And, and that may be a criminal act of doing something, but I wonder how – I mean, if war is one nation versus another nation, one state versus another state, and you don't know who to attack, isn't the best thing to do to and, defend yourself oh, properly? And I think that that's a great point. I think that actually I disagree with you know just focusing in on the defense, but that's one of the things that, that bothers me is a lot of organizations, they're very much into the can- contain and clear methodology. I've been hacked. Get it off my system. And I think there's a lot that we can understand from watch and learn. Like if, some, if I hack your network, I'm evil, put on my black hat, compromise your network, and I start downloading porn on your system, that sucks. But if you're a defense contractor... That's no, great. It's, for, <laughs> it's free. <laughs> hey, it, 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 it solves gun? that guy's uh, question about the Internet. We bring the Internet to your employees. Uh, it makes it a lot easier. But if you watch and see what I do, and all of a sudden I start searching for top secret, and you start understanding what it is that I'm after in your environment, then you have a better understanding of who it is that's coming after you, regardless of where they're coming well, from. And, and I'd like to throw this to the panel for a second, but don't, we, uh, don't you believe that when we talk about attribution, we're not just focusing on cyber. If it's a nation-state on nation-state yes. attack, we have other means to determine whether it was them other than just tracing the packets. Yeah, that's a, that's a frustrating thing for me. They, they bring up the problem of attribution. And yes, there is a problem of attribution. I think a, a sufficiently determined and very careful attacker can make it very hard to trace back. But sometimes they want to claim responsibility, right? It, you don't want to hide the fact that you've done it. So you can't just use the problem of attribution to sort of rule out offensive cyber warfare. All right, next question, please. I haven't heard much discussion about botnets and their use in cyber warfare. And uh, 
Obviously, spamming and DDoS attacks, of course, are the number one, number two things that are out there. How can we stop the proliferation of botnets in such a way that, uh, I mean, let's take, you don't have to be a nation to uh, take down a system with a well, you know, with a well botnet. And I haven't heard anything talk about that. So can we have some discussion about that? Can I, let me suggest, um, having worked beside my colleague, Dmitry Alperovitch, for like, what, five years? Am I that old now? Too long. Yeah, I'd like to let our moderator address this, because I could go on forever about it, but this is one of our, our experts, and I think this is something you should talk about. He's like, wow, no, you want to buy mine? That. <laughs> Before you get going, yeah, yeah. a botnet is a perfect example of cloud computing. Absolutely. And we are all moving to cloud computing, so we don't do away with botnets. It's a wonderful use of resources. No, um, botnets are an abuse of the field of distributed computing that we all studied 20 years ago. That's what cloud computing is. No, it's not. And we're learning it's from It's not done very efficiently. You know, I'm really disappointed. They don't tend to communicate a lot with each other. It's uh, pretty disappointing. No, I mean, it, it is a huge problem. Uh, I think uh, unless you secure the endpoint, you're not going to deal with it. And uh, I don't see us um, having much progress in it in that area. Do you um, think we've abandoned the home user, though? I think the home user has abandoned us. Well, is a home <laughs> user a combatant on a future cyber battlefield? Is grandma's computer a weapon system? Well, I was actually, I was in Australia it's, it's, it's uh, about a week ago, and they actually have a, a pretty low problem with botnets, and, and the interesting thing about how they're solving it involuntarily is, is it's all about economics. In Australia, you actually pay for your bandwidth. So you get like a rate that gives you five gigs a month or whatever, and you exceed that, you pay quite a bit of money for that. So when someone contacts a home user and tells them they're exploited and they're sending spam or whatever, they have a huge motivation to shut it down, and they do. Maybe they don't know how, but they ask for help, and, and, and they get it. Here in the U.S. And, and other places where we have unlimited bandwidth at home, you call up an end user, and uh, they have absolutely no incentive to fix it. Yeah, but you know, saying that you know, let's just go and have all metered internet connectivity, and that'll solve the problem of malware. You can have uh, lots of unintended consequences from an economic perspective. I I don't want to go that. Oh, way. I wasn't advertising yeah. that. Yeah. I was just using an example. Let our Australian Next question, friends please. live there, and not us. Um, Move a little closer. Closer. <laughs> just like the guy before you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was you need a manual? I was wondering, would you, um, I want to know where you stand in your opinion on the very, like, on the fact that the capture the flag contest could be a very vague and shallow um, view of what actual cyber warfare is. Yeah, capture the flag is like taking a bunch of Boy Scouts out to the 22 rifle range and saying that that's trained infantry. <laughs> it's getting there, no it doubt, yeah. but it's a very controlled environment. But, but really, there's a lot to learn from Capture the Flag, but I th and you're on the right track, but, but it's not exactly the same. But how many people in the world have the skills of the room next door? That's right. And, and I think that that's one of the things that, that I think a lot of nations are looking at that and saying, you know what, we need to have those skill sets as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's that national cyber challenge also that's going to try right, and yep, raise yep. us. Let's keep moving, and please formulate a question before you get to the mic. Um, we want to move things quickly. Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. How y'all doing? Good. Uh, y'all were talking about supply chain attack earlier, and I'm wondering who should be responsible for defending that if we leave it up to the private industry bringing those chips in to do QA, or if we have someone like Customs, you know, through policy or something, you know. Because as those, those hardware pieces yeah. and the firmware stuff come into more of our networks, they become more of a threat. So, is that? Yeah. It's a yeah. very, very difficult problem of liability and so forth. I think all, you, you could talk about how you could try to split up the liability across all the different companies that are the piece parts, but I think ultimately the solution is going to have to involve the person that is representing the completed built product has to absorb that responsibility. They can try to, you know, sue somebody else down the line if they need to later, but you have to have that person that is pulling the product together. Um, there's no better place to put that. Yeah. Hey, Adrian. Hello. A uh, couple times online I've seen uh, Marcus Random do his particular take on it, and I wanted to get y'all's opinion on something he said about um, the asymmetric uh, nature of cyber warfare. Yeah. One of his points was if someone was, uh, had lesser power than a greater power, It'd be kind of like thumbing Mike Tyson's eye in a dark closet, you know. Yeah, you, you might hurt him, but you're not going to like the results. You get a bunch of Marines land on your area. Um, or if you're a country of size that you could actually physically defend yourself, 
then you're blinding the other nation, and the first response is, well, we can't see what the other nation's doing, so let's start firing nukes. I'd like to see, I just want to see what y'all's response were to those two particular issues that Marcus brought up. Well, today, mature Western countries, at least, understand what it means to go to war. Oh, passes. Awesome. Very cool. Room numbers. Hey, party awesome. passes. Yeah, very cool. We'll Thank be you, seeing sir. you later. Thank you, Adrian. Very nice. I don't expect the United States or any Western nation, it, if, if they come under a cyber attack, to immediately start launching the B-52s and, and uncovering the silos and, and, launching, and pushing oh, awesome. the nukes out. That's, uh, that's a bit of a stretch. Well, we did have the in Russia, in Russia um, back in the 90s, a number of generals, high-level um, high generals, saying that they reserve the right to respond with even nuclear weapons to an information attack in their country. Of course, yeah. in Russia, generals don't make policy. And we FSB did have does, a, but we did have a U.S. congressman <laughs> wanting us to go after North Korea because of a DDoS also. So. Right, right. That's because the Internet is made of pipes, right? Yeah, it's, it's tubes. <laughs> tubes. Tubes, tubes. I'm sorry. But, I mean, the, the, the fact is sometimes smaller, weaker countries do want to get in the face of a bigger country, and this gives them another opportunity to do that. Um, I think it's inevitable. It will happen. Right, this is what happens in kinetic. It's a soft right, it Ball happens points. in the kinetic world. It happens in the cyber world. Yeah, yeah um, there's been an awful lot made of uh, the risk to infrastructure systems like uh, power, air traffic control systems, even water delivery, sewer, these kinds of things. You know, the Chinese are going to shut off the, the the power systems, and somebody else is going to turn off uh, traffic lights. Well, I want to know, you know, what idiot decided that? Uh, the air traffic control system should be on the internet in the first place. And maybe one of the ways to protect against it is take it off the frickin' internet. The idiot that wanted his porn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amen, well, we're bro. trying to hire Gen Xers, and they need the internet to yeah. stay happy at work. Yeah, how do I get XM so. Radio on United if it's not on the internet? Right? Yeah, exactly. I think you're, you're 100% right, but man, the world is just not going that direction. You, you, no. you remember right. the case well, of the Dreamliner? Rethink. Boeing yeah. that wanted to connect the, the cockpit oh, to yeah. the internet? Yeah, no, the problem, yeah. I mean, yeah. you're, you're right on the money. The issue is we've got to get our senior people educated that these yeah. simple, easy things that they want to do are going to put them in grave danger. It worked before there was an internet, right? Yeah, so why yeah. shouldn't it work now? Yep. And, and for that education, we do thank Bruce Willis immensely. Uh, but I, <laughs> you're I quite a fan, wanna, aren't you? I, I do want to stress the point, though. We have Morpheus, <laughs> and we have Bruce, Bruce Willis. IP, yeah. no, IP enabling yeah, is different than being on <laughs> Right. So... Adding IP enablement, is that a word, to these, and electronic, and the ability to meter things and, moder and uh, monitor things remotely, that's huge. And that adds to our ability to provide good grid services, to measure the amount of electricity flowing, to make sure there's 60 gig on both sides. So there's a big difference between, well, there's a big difference between electronically enabling them and putting them on the internet. And I think that's what a lot of people just don't get. Melissa was misquoted. I'm acting like a press secretary here. <laughs> <laughs> well, since I waited in line, I want to just congratulate this and dude. Thank for, you. Real close to the mic. Sorry. I wanted to congratulate this dude for reading my mind and asking the exact question: Why, why, why was SCADA ever put on IP networks? It's ridiculous. So they have tin foil hats next door. If you're afraid that your mind is being read. Yeah. yeah. Now, why they're putting it on there, the question is, why are the vendors building devices that have 100, bit or 100 megabit Ethernet jacks on it and IP enablement? And, and uh, on the websites, if you go to some of these vendor sites, it says, uh, we've put the stack on there so that the engineer can manage the system from home. Those words are yep. literally yep. on there, on their websites. Yep. They're stupid. Yes, sir. Right. Thank oh, you. Oh, there we yeah. have it. Yeah. That's exactly right. Folks, right, so, we so are dumbasses. Why? Well, I got one more question. Who thinks these guys kick serious ass? All right! Now where the fuck is our beer?